Hello, hello, and welcome back to CS four nine two F in fall two thousand twenty three. We are talking about futures of the world, and last time we started uh, giving examples of futurologists, namely of the science fiction authors, as one <clears throat> profession. Uh, that uh, um, encourages and uh, promotes making predictions about the future. Specifically, we discuss the life and the oeuvre of Stanislav Lem. Let me remind you of Stanislav Lem. So here you see. Uh, Lem, who was born in 1921 in what was then <clears throat> Ukraine, and he died in 2006 in Krakow, Poland. He made <clears throat> many predictions during a time when technology was uh, still in its early stages. Here you see some examples of computers from uh, 1955 to 1961. And during these times, what he <clears throat> predicted was uh, basically what we nowadays have in computer technology. For example, he predicted the e-book, an electronic book, <clears throat> where the pages, uh, one has only one page, but its content changes. He predicted audiobooks, <clears throat> namely that this ebook can read its own content to the uh, listener. He predicted databases, namely <clears throat> so called informatic machines. That was uh, his terminology for computers, uh, in, translated from Polish, actually, right? <clears throat> and he predicted that these informatic machines <clears throat> will support banks of memory at a time when computers had uh, up to one kilobyte and sometimes uh, two kilobyte was the maximum of a computer memory at that time. And he predicted entire banks of memory. And he predicted that these banks of memories will be connected to each other, thus forming computer nets, first on a, uh, uh, extending through states, then throughout continents and later was his prediction and we're we'll yet to see that on a planetary scale. So the first two predictions have already happened. We have nowadays have the internet connecting uh, through continents and his next stage was about connecting through planets. And this is still I'm going to say upcoming. Right, so he predicted beta bases. He predicted the internet and he predicted um, being able to search uh, also <clears throat> all kinds of data. Um, I mean, texts, sure, but also sounds and even uh, smells. I mean, he wrote that Tryon, that is his name of his uh, computer technology, Tryon can store not only luminescent images reduced to a change in their crystal structure, that is images of book pages, right? And we nowadays have Google Books uh, providing images of book page pages, but he predicted that also kinds, all kinds of photographs, maps, right? Google Maps, images, Google Image Search, graphs and tables, yeah, Google uh, a Spreadsheet, in other words, anything that can be observed by sight visually. Just as easily Tran can store sounds, things that can be heard. Yeah, that's kind of, <clears throat> you know, like iTunes. Uh, the human voice as well as music. Yeah, audiobooks, podcasts, and everything. And there's also a way to record sense, that is smell. Again, the last one is still, the uh, last prediction is still uh, to come. So 
We also predicted uh, three-dimensional printers, namely <clears throat> that the, this trion is able to create objects from uh, its electronic description. Uh, this is what we call 3D printer. One common theme is uh, the limitations of humans to complement other <clears throat> uh, uh, things, and particularly alien, and that's one explanation um, for the uh, great filter, because maybe uh, other intelligence, non-human intelligence, where humans are very uh, anthropocentric and <clears throat> believe that all intelligence must be human intelligence. And if you think about it, the current uh, 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 fad about artificial intelligence, this is implicitly all about human intelligence and uh, uh, neglects, disregards other kinds of intelligence. And uh, he illustrated that in, a, in this science fiction story. Uh, <clears throat> um, by pure chance, scientists discover a signal from space that could be a statement from rational beings. How can we read this message knowing nothing about the senders? What if we are not even <clears throat> sure whether they exist? Right, so if you remember, for example, the science fiction movie Contact with Jodie Foster, their <clears throat> important part is uh, to uh, decode uh, the language <clears throat> Um, of other intelligence, and there it's based on uh, prime numbers. Of course, prime numbers are universal in a sense, right? Another uh, story of a um, lamb called Eden uh, describes a starship that lands in an alien world they call Eden. After escaping the wrecked ship, they set out to explore the planet, first traveling through an unsettling wilderness, and coming upon an abandoned automated factory. There they find a constant cycle of materials being produced, then destroyed and recycled. Now to us that sounds kind of strange and surprising. Why this constant cycle of production and uh, destruction and then recycling? Um, but that's uh, <clears throat> because of our human perspective. Um, yeah, for example, if aliens were to observe our actions on, on Earth, they would be equally <clears throat> uh, perplexed about uh, <clears throat> the way humans act on Earth, humans uh, wage war against each other, uh, <clears throat> destroy the environment. All this is very <clears throat> incomprehensible to an outsider. And similarly, in uh, Lem's story, um, to the human astronauts, they find it incomprehensible while the aliens on that planet Eden uh, keep producing and then destroying and recycling uh, materials. <clears throat> Indeed, in the story, they find a local sentient alien and <clears throat> start trying to communication. And <clears throat> one first obstacle to communication is they, <clears throat> they communicate with uh, <clears throat> magnetic fields. Uh, Right? This is something that our senses cannot even grasp. I mean, we can uh, grasp touch, sound. We can also grasp a small spectrum of electromagnetic waves, maybe light spectrum from roughly 300 to 700 nanometers. But purely magnetic field is not something we can grasp. So that's the first obstacle. <clears throat> and once they, the crew develops the technology to understand <clears throat> uh, that uh, uh, magnetic uh, um, fields communication, the next issue is, of course, about the content. And that's uh, even more <clears throat> difficult if you think about foreigners living in another country, um, like uh, uh, <clears throat> we living in Korea or Koreans living abroad. This is uh, all the cultural background uh, behind communication in a high text culture, high text communication is, is very important. Without that, it's really uh, very difficult to understand what's going on. And here <clears throat> we express the skepticism 
with respect to the possibility of mutual comprehension, the very difference of respective technologies, that's the magnetic field communication medium, prevents newcomers and locals from each other. And after having <clears throat> overcome that, uh, other uh, cultural ob obstacles uh, and political obstacles um, mm, uh, impede communication. And finally, there's this uh, very famous book, also very complicated book, Solaris, describing um, a planet that is actually conscious. So an entire planet being intelligent and naturally takes a long time for humans in this story to even realize that, right? Because when we look for intelligence, we look for human-like intelligence, we look for individuals uh, that behave and think very much like, like humans, but the mere concept of an entire planet being one singular intelligent entity that is uh, something very hard to, gra hard to grasp. And yet Lem um, manages not only to conceive such a, a possibility, but also to turn that into a convincing story about this planet. And we saw uh, short uh, a summary of there have been various uh, attempts of turning that into movies. Okay, that was uh, uh, a lemon. And finally, on a uh, <clears throat> more funny note, he also wrote a book about the future of logical congress. Right, so <clears throat> he made fun of uh, futurologists. Um, uh, yeah, basically also of himself. Right, he was a futurologist. Um, so, and it has recently been turned into a movie that uh, contains both animated parts and and real actors and i highly recommend watching the movie or reading the book or both so that uh, is our recap of uh, stanislav lem um, and last uh, session today we're going to start uh, about uh, talking about arthur clark arthur c clark sir arthur charles clark um, you see a picture of him on the set of the movie 2001 Odyssey in Space, a very famous movie. And uh, actually the movie was developed uh, simultaneously um, uh, with a, a script. And uh, only later, a short time later, the book about the movie, the kind of screenplay was turned into a book by Arthur Clarke. So he was born in Somerset and he, he died uh, in Sri Lanka. And here's a, a post of this movie, 2001 a Space Aussie, where he, Odyssey, where he uh, envisioned and predicted so many things that indeed have uh, nowadays become uh, common uh, technology. And the question is, did he really predict that? Or have engineers uh, been inspired and followed uh, by these ideas and then uh, after watching the movie, try to realize uh, the idea? So that's, a, that's an important aspect of prediction, self-fulfilling prediction, right? So <clears throat> um, let me say that again. Um, if something um, promising, is predicted um, by futurologists, uh, by science fiction authors, then that provides guidance to engineer to actually build that. And I emphasize that because that's also something I keep emphasizing uh, as an important part of theoretical computer science uh, and generally about science itself by exploring things before they can or have been realized technologically. My standard example is Alan Turing, who kind of uh, uh, <clears throat> formalized the digital computer in 1936, five years before the first digital computer actually became operational, the SUSE Z3 computer in 1941. And uh, 
five years before. And similarly, <clears throat> Arthur Clarke maybe did uh, well, on the one hand predict, but also on the other hand uh, guided engineers to realize that nowadays <clears throat> many of his predictions have actually been uh, realized. So let's uh, look into some of them. Right. Clark's work is marked by an optimistic view of science, empowering mankind's exploration of the solar system and the world's ocean. So it's a, not a dystopian uh, view, uh, as for example, in, in Blade Runner is a dystopian uh, uh, perspective on the future. And uh, uh, Arthur C. Clarke is uh, mostly optimistic, although uh, he also uh, warned about the dangers of artificial intelligence, namely the fault in his hell computer. I'm going to show you a, a, a movie clip in a few minutes. His images of the future often feature a utopian setting with highly developed technology, ecology, and society based on the author's ideals. So that's again an important lesson or message to take away. So when developing ideas as a futurologist, um, um, keep in mind that they uh, might and maybe will be later realized self-fulfilling prophecy. So better make them good ideas rather than bad ideas. Yeah, <clears throat> that's the, <clears throat> the one example of a bad idea, uh, obviously, is uh, <clears throat> um, the Nazi society. Hitler had an idea of a society, and that was a very bad idea, and <clears throat> uh, it uh, became uh, implemented and uh, uh, had terrible, terrible uh, consequences. So, uh, yeah, <clears throat> the, the ideals uh, are very important. A recurring theme in Clark's work is the notion that the evolution of an intelligent species would eventually make them something close to gods. Yes, and that is uh, also <clears throat> very true. And as I've pointed out at the <clears throat> uh, introduction, um, um, compared to other species on this planet, we have developed basically godlike technology, right? You remember the quote, we humans are governed by ancient emotions. We have uh, um, institutions from the middle, from the dark ages, uh, and we have technology that is close to gods, and this is very dangerous, right? So we're basically <clears throat> already uh, ourselves on this stage. So let me show you some um, predictions um, of Arthur Clark and some of his um, um, movie clips. One second. Right. So this movie was made in 1968, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey was created in 1968, and at 1968, um, <clears throat> Color TV had been only two years old. It was introduced in 1966, Color TV. Um, and uh, this was before the moon landing. Moon landing was in uh, late 1969, right? Um, so in 1968, the movie was released, okay, released. And in this movie, um, already predicted video phone. This is what we nowadays uh, use, like in Skype, right? But uh, at that time, this was way ahead of technology. So let me show you here the... Right, you, you see the visionary um, power and how it has been realized is, of course, very different. Um, they uh, recorded the, the video first with a um, with a uh, actor um, off camera um, providing the 
counterpart to the communication with the little girl. And then later they played the recorded uh, uh, interaction on the on the screen while the actor playing the astronaut would uh, <clears throat> adjust and uh, replay the the other half of the communication. And you also see <clears throat> that there's a charge and uh, incurred, and also there's a prediction of space travel, right? So the the <clears throat> the man. Uh, yeah, uh, reminds uh, his daughter that he is traveling and that means space travel and this is all in 1968 <clears throat> predictive power and nowadays we have all that uh, we have uh, uh, space travel right <clears throat> and like a uh, uh, virgin uh, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> what's it called virgin and, and Elon Musk is uh, um, promoting space travel um, uh, this happens in a space station. Well, we have a space station like Mir and uh, <clears throat> video phone. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, <clears throat> what we're doing right now in this lecture, right? Zoom. And this all uh, <clears throat> like uh, uh, 50, 50 years ahead of time. Let me give you an, uh, another excerpt from this movie, 2001, about the uh, um, computer uh, hell 9000 and just to remind you so you see the uh, uh, so it is called hell 9000 now that's a, a, a reference of course at that time computers were basically synonymous with IBM IBM was the computer company Right. So, and if you increment each of the three letters here, the successor to H is I, the successor to A is B, and the successor to L is M. So this is a hidden reference to IBM um, because, of, <clears throat> of course, uh, IBM uh, has copyrights and didn't want to be uh, associated with any uh, aspects of that, the computer's depiction in the movie. So let me play that uh, movie clip. Uh, also, right, you see here another important prediction of the movie. So this is what the astronaut is eating in outer uh, space on the space station. There's no gravity. Interesting how they realized no gravity, uh, or the rather the uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, centrifuge gravity. And also here you see what we nowadays would call an, um, an iPad, right? So uh, <clears throat> computer uh, or display screen for, um, for communication. So let me show you the movie clip, another movie clip from the this movie 2001. Um, <clears throat> you notice again <clears throat> the visionary power of uh, Arthur Clarke in, in this movie. Uh, <clears throat> maybe he predicted artificial intelligence, right? So this um, HAL or HAL computer is able <clears throat> to com communicate uh, with, with humans and to control the ship <clears throat> and to make own decision. He also predicted uh, um, uh, uh, human stasis, putting people to freeze uh, in order to survive the long uh, journeys between uh, stars. Uh, this is, of course, uh, nowadays a common theme in science fiction, but uh, it was, I think it's fair to say, invented uh, <clears throat> by Arthur C. Clarke. And you may also remember this uh, cryogenics, <laughs> where people uh, let them self uh, put to freeze uh, uh, right before death either the whole the just the head or the entire body this all <clears throat> dates back to to this movie so again <clears throat> question is did the movie predict the future or did the movie inspire and thus create the future or put differently a question for you to ask 
or with respect to your assignments, when you make such a, a prediction or a plan about uh, one aspect like a, a, a future of education, um, um, be aware that this is not just a prediction, but uh, also uh, uh, vision uh, guidance uh, <clears throat> for maybe education and educators to go into this new direction that you envision. And this is, of course, uh, ethically a very delicate question, right? So if you were able to, for example, to predict the um, uh, lottery outcomes uh, uh, as a futurologist, would you make use of that for your own personal gains? Or how would you make uh, employ your uh, abilities to predict or to uh, guide and uh, create a future? So be very sensitive <clears throat> about the ethical implications of your assignments. This is not at all uh, apparent superficially, um, but uh, important. I'll try to uh, return to this point frequently during throughout the, this first part of the course. So now uh, resuming um, the, the slide. Yes, so Arthur Clark predicted uh, putting people to, to, to sleep, to freeze. Um, he predicted space station, he predicted space travel. Um, he predicted robots in space, right? I mean, the Mars lander <clears throat> is basically a robot uh, put into space um, but, uh, several decades after what Arthur C. Clarke had predicted this. Yes, that concludes uh, our discussion of Arthur C. Clarke. And we now move on to another <clears throat> visionary science fiction uh, author and futurologist, Isaac Asimov. So here's the slide about Isaac Asimov. Here's a picture of him. He was uh, born in Petrovici in uh, Russia. Um, and at the age of three, he, his parents moved to the United States and took him with them. And that's where he spent the rest of his life. And he died in New York City in 1992. And uh, he was extremely prolific. Over a space of 40 years, he published an average of 1,000 words a day. Now, not that this should be a rule or guidance, but this is a, <clears throat> everybody's different. But he was very prolific and at some <clears throat> uh, at some point of his career, uh, within the 40 years, over a space of 20 years, he even published like 1,500 words a day. And one of the uh, <clears throat> novels he published is I, Robot. Okay. Now you might have read this book, and if you have not, then you might have uh, What's the Movie with Robin Williams. Anyone watch the movie, I, Robot, which is kind of a movie about this book. And in this book, he introduced the three laws of robotics, which we are, are nowadays famous, right? So the first law means <clears throat> that uh, robot must not harm a human. And the second law must, says uh, that the robot must follow the uh, orders of uh, its human master unless that would violate the first law. So there's a priority among the laws. Um, and this is to prevent, for example, a uh, human from abusing a robot in order to conduct a crime against another human. So first law, um, uh, do not harm humans. And second law, follow the order of your human master unless that 
would violate the first law. And the third law is, uh, um, is <clears throat> to kind of protect yourself, unless that would violate the second or the first law, in which case uh, the robot is actually supposed to sacrifice himself um, in order to uh, <clears throat> obey the uh, second or first law, because they have priority. So, I mean, this is a very basic, but also very visionary, uh, because it already starts uh, something like uh, uh, legislating the future, right? Uh, because nowadays what we, <clears throat> the laws that we uh, have made in our parliaments, right? So laws are made by parliaments and <clears throat> are enforced by police and are uh, judged by uh, by judges, right? So that's uh, this three-fold separation of power. Uh, parliaments create the laws, and usually the laws are created uh, ad hoc because something new has come up, right? So for example, cyber laws. Cyber laws uh, became necessary as the uh, cyber realm uh, uh, grew and became more important, right? Uh, laws about like cyber defamation became necessary because <clears throat> uh, cyber defamation became prevalent. So law making usually uh, follows and is behind actual development. But remember, <clears throat> our goal uh, the goal of futurology is to get ahead of that and uh, to now make the laws that govern us, that steer us into the future and not later uh, try to mend uh, the future that uh, we have uh, inadvertently run into. Okay? And uh, the three laws of probiotics is a basic but uh, first such example of already nowadays making laws, uh, envisioning laws about a possible future uh, before that future actually happens. Right, so that's uh, iRobot. Um, another um, famous uh, um, uh, book, actually an entire series, um, a part of that prolificity of uh, Isomov is the foundation series. So here you see the cover of the very first uh, book in that series, but uh, this only started, uh, namely the series extended from 1942. So when Asimov was like 22 years old, he, he published uh, this first book and then kept writing more and more. And the last book was uh, uh, published after his death, actually. Okay, so very prolific and uh, why was this so is this so famous because it develops an entire uh, narrative an entire universe right with its own politics with its own technology so this is this is a really detailed um, like an alternative not just an alternative world or an alternative time but a whole universe imagined and <clears throat> stories, various stories um, developing, evolving in that universe. So here's the background. In the waning days of a future galactic empire, the mathematician, yes, mathematician, I'm a mathematician, the mathematician Harry Seldon, Seldon, right? Uh, you know the Big Bang Theory, <laughs> Sheldon Cooper, why is he called Sheldon Cooper? He's called Cooper because of the uh, Bartine Cooper theory of uh, of uh, uh, superconductivity, and his friend's named Sheldon. You see where that was borrowed from, right? Uh, I also mentioned, right? So uh, uh, Leonard Hofstetter, another character in that uh, in that comedy series, uh, Leonard after Leonard Euler, right, mathematician, and Hofstetter after Douglas Hofstetter. So <clears throat> uh, the characters in that 
uh, committee series are, are kind of uh, <clears throat> combined from uh, names of uh, various uh, yeah sources. Anyway, so Harry Sheldon is the mathematician, mathematician, mathematician in the foundation series of Isaac Asimov, and he spends his life developing a theory of so-called pseudo history, pseudo pseudo history, a new and effective mathematics of sociology. Now, can you imagine that, right? Uh, this is has not yet been implemented yet, but maybe it will, right? Um, right, so currently mathematics and sociology are largely different areas. So sociology uses mathematics maybe uh, mostly, if at all, then for statistical evaluations of, uh, of experiments, of uh, polls, uh, but uh, using mathematics to predict uh, social effects, that's the topic of uh, pseudo history. Using statistical laws of mass action, it can predict the future of large populations. And that's, of course, extremely powerful, right? Imagine a government uh, is able to predict the future of its own population, which uh, has elected the government, right? That uh, a kind of great power cycle. Shelton foresees the imminent fall of the empire and then starts trying to prevent that. But of course, according to his own theory, it's impossible. That's the thing, right? So he uses mathematics to predict the future. This is also uh, what we're trying to do, to predict the future. And he uses, develops mathematics to be able to do that. And then he's able to make such a prediction, uh, but it's a bad prediction, fall of the empire. And then he tries to prevent his own prediction, uh, knowing well that it is impossible. So the best he can do is try to uh, uh, ease, ease the fall of the empire, which is inevitable. In so very, very interesting promise, I think, very original an unusual promise and uh, uh, rich enough to uh, support this entire book series. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's uh, now have a look at uh, uh, some prediction of Isaac Asimov and uh, also let uh, hear himself speak. So what I'm going to show you is uh, a video from a YouTube channel by another futurologist, a nowadays futurologist, uh, and his name is uh, Isaac Arthur. Okay, and uh, it's a coincidence or not that his name is very similar to Isaac Asimov. So and Isaac Arthur has a also is also very prolific and creates a lot of um, uh, predictions about the future. And in his episode number 166, he <clears throat> talks, Isaac Arthur talks about Isaac Asimov and Isaac Asimov predictions. And this is what I'd like to share with you, because this is one futurologist talking about another futurologist. Very, very interesting. So here we are. And here we go. So here we are on New Year's Eve, getting ready right to head into 2019, the 50th anniversary of the moon landings. But it also happens to be the 35th anniversary of an article Isaac Asimov wrote on December 31st, 1983 for the Toronto Star, which they recently reprinted predicting the world of 2019. We already did our year-end episode, and for that matter, our own predictions for 31 years from now for the year 2050 a couple weeks back. But since Asimov is still the Grand Master of Science Fiction, even 27 years after his death, and my namesake, and since we're skipping this month's live stream, it seemed worth taking a bit of time to look at the world he saw for tomorrow. A link to the article is in the video description. On the eve of 1984, he starts off by noting that he picked 35 years ahead 
because George Orwell's novel, 1984, had just celebrated its 35th anniversary. Interestingly, it's also the year my favorite film, Blade Runner, is set in, which had come out the year before. Streaming will be from noon on New Year's Eve to noon on New Year's Day, Eastern US time, and we'll be having a lot of guests, including our good friends Fraser Kane and John Michael Gaudier. Times are still a bit tentative as I write this, but I should be on at 3.45 PM Eastern, December 31st, and it should be an exciting event. Right, so this is one futurologist named Arthur, uh, Isaac Arthur, about uh, reporting about uh, another futurologist, Isaac Asimov, and <clears throat> I think this is a very interesting interplay. So <clears throat> let me uh, show you the, the slide about uh, Isaac Arthur. Yes, and as, as usual, I strongly recommend uh, also <clears throat> listening and uh, uh, watching his uh, opinions, his YouTube channel or this uh, podcast here. Um, but let, let me wrap up today's uh, uh, class, today's lecture with a, a recorded interview of Isaac Asimov himself. So. <clears throat> And uh, maybe how he got into uh, into science fiction. That is very interesting, and he's, he's giving a very humorous description, um, uh, giving uh, indication of his uh, great character. Actually, so let's uh, uh, wrap things up with uh, this part. So there's no video; it's only sound. But uh, I'm gonna turn on. Captions. Here we go. The reason I'm here, however, is to predict the future, and it is very likely that you'll want to know what gives me the right to predict the future, right? I mean, what are my qualifications? So I'll tell you what my qualifications to predict the future are. My chief qualification took place in 1952 when I found myself in Chicago. I found myself in Chicago because I had to address the American Chemical Society, which was a thankless task. I discussed a, some experiments of mine and got very few laughs. So, so I decided to visit the offices of a small science fiction magazine called Universe Science Fiction. At any rate, I had to think of something fast because I was ashamed to say that I didn't have the slightest idea of what to write. And thinking quickly, I wrote a story called Everest, because there, Everest was much in the news then. And I thought that since seven expeditions had failed, that I might as well write a little story about why expeditions failed. And I explained it by saying that the abominable snowmen were Martians. And they kept, Amer they kept human travelers off the top. She read the story, bought it on the spot for $30. I spent half of it in a dinner for her and me. In those days, you could buy a very good dinner for two for $15 and got nowhere. <laughs> Went home, a sadder and wiser man, and forgot about it until the next May 30th, 1953, when somebody to whom I hadn't done a darn thing named Edmund Hillary and his Sherpa sidekick, Tenzing Nargay, climbed Mount Everest and at 11.30 a.m. stood at the very tippy tip top, they said. And, <laughs> well, who is there to check up, you know? <laughs> and that instantly placed universe science fiction in a very, very strange ethical dilemma. If they published the story, they would make me look like a fool and if they didn't publish story, the story, they would lose $30. And it took them a second and a quarter to decide to publish. And they did. They published in the December 1953 issue. So that there is my record as a predictor of the future. I am the only man living who ever predicted that Mount Everest would never be climbed five months after.
So this is the funny story about Isaac Asimov, how he got into uh, predicting the future by predicting that Mount Everest would never be climbed five months after it was climbed. Right, so on this humorous uh, uh, note, let's uh, end the story. Uh, let's end today's uh, lecture. And next time we're going to talk about another um, great man of uh, uh, science fiction and futurology, Robert Henlein. That's all for today. And as always, I'm uh, ready and available uh, online to uh, answer your questions and to conduct some discussions. And by the way,